Hello, this is Lynn Hilton Wilson, and I'm thrilled to be part of the Come Follow Me team to continue looking at the New Testament Sermon on the Mount. Last week, as we looked at chapter 5, we saw parallels between the Torah and Jesus' teachings. The Torah, of course, is the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And today, as we finish up the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6 and 7, we see commentary on the prophets. It's very interesting as we look at the beautiful parallels between the Sermon on the Mount and Moses and Jesus. Remember, Moses was on Mount Sinai when he gave the law, and now Christ, the new Moses, is on a mountain giving the higher law. We also see Matthew's gospel organized into five different sections, and he finishes each one with the same verse. Sometimes these five discourses are called the Christian Pentateuch. I also want to remind you, we touched a little bit last week on how the Sermon on the Mount is very similar to a temple text and has lots of parallels, not only between the ancient temples and other temples. John W. Welch has referred to this in his book, Illuminating the Sermon at the Temple and the Sermon on the Mount. I just want to review a little bit about last week so that this week's we can keep in context. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, he talked about those blessings promised in the Beatitudes. And then they began making covenants, and the disciples were referred to as the salt of the earth because salt is used with every covenant. And then the first set of laws were explained. Then by chapter 5, verse 19, they talked about the law of obedience and sacrifice. And there's a prohibition against anger and ridicule of the brethren. And reconciliation was needed before proceeding further. Chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Then the higher of law of chastity was introduced in chapter 27. The marriage covenant was discussed in verse 31. Then oaths were sworn by saying yes or no, verse 33 to 37. Then he discusses how to love our enemies, chapter 5, verse 38 to 48. And then finally, chapter 5 finishes as we transition to a higher order. Now, hopefully, some of these from the Old Testament rang true to you, and you see this symbolism of the temple practices. Chapter 6 now begins with the admonition to give to the poor. I see the Savior calling his apostles together, calling those who are ready to live the higher law, and asking them to create a Zion society. And as they do so, the word alms is interesting because it has more than one meaning. Chapter 6, verse 1 to 4 says in the NIV translation, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, not to be seen by them. So instead of referring to almsgiving, they use a different word. In fact, I noticed eight different very popular English translations using eight different words here. Listen to this. Alms in King James, kindness in the LSV, good deeds in the AB, charity giving in the BPE, righteousness I mentioned in the NIV, justice in the DRB, and religious duties in the GNT, and good actions in the Whitecliffe New Testament. So very interesting. This idea of giving alms has a very broad meaning. And the problem with it is we don't want to seek to do this in front of other people. That's what the Savior is opposed to. If we're doing this to be seen of men, we're doing it for the wrong motivation. And that includes our charitable gifts, our kindness, our justice, our religious duties, anything The Sermon on the Mount is talking about changing our outward motives to becoming inwardly more purified. In fact, he repeats multiple times, if you are doing this to be seen of men, if you're trying to get on the Hall of Fame, if your motivation and success is to have worldly acclaim, you are not doing it for the right motives. In fact, he calls them hypocrites. And he defines a hypocrisy, he uses this word both in verse 2, 5, and 16. Remember in the ancient world, a hypocrite is one who wore a mask. In the Greek dramas, and the Greek plays, if you had a mask on your face, you were then acting as a hypocrite. You were not yourself. You were acting as someone else. And our Savior is saying, I want your actions to be consistent with the, your heart. And I want you to do good, but I want your heart to be motivated to serve God and to love others. I don't want your heart in the wrong place. In addition to chapter 6, verse 2, 5, and 16, Matthew also refers to it in chapter 15 and 16 and 22 and 23. (laughs) And then Mark talks about it and Luke talks about it in five or six places. Anyway, it's interesting. Even in the book of Acts and the book of James, this became a very important message in Christianity. And I believe it's part of 
our discipleship now. Is your heart aligned with your actions? Now, sometimes we go through the motions because our heart, we wish our heart were aligned. We want it to be aligned. And so we go through the motions seeking to have a soft and pure heart. That is better than nothing. But he's asking his disciples, he's asking the apostles, please make sure your heart is what is motivating you, not the riches or the fame of the world. He continues on in another translation in verse 2. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Let's not um, be philanthropists for the joy of getting our name down. In verse 5 through 15, he then focuses on prayer. And as he introduces this new order of prayer, he starts out with private prayer and then moves to public prayer. Verse 5 and 6 refer to private prayer. Remember when he says, when ye pray, and then again, he repeats it. Do not do it to be seen of men. If you, if you want to be seen of men, you're going to have your reward. But if you want your reward from God, pray so that you can commune with God, so that your will can align with his. I like the NIV of chapter 6, verse 6. Go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. This beautiful message of kneeling down in worship before our God is something that comes from an internal desire to be forgiven, to repent, and to seek to know God's will in our lives. Chapter 6, verse 7 continues on. Use not vain repetitions. I looked up some other translations on this one too, and I really like the NIVs. Don't keep on babbling like the pagans. Don't make your prayers long just to babble. Uh, in the New American Standard Bible, it says, don't use thoughtless repetitions. And the more I began thinking about vain repetitions, I realized it's far more than just talking about repeating our words, because some of our words can be repeated with great sincerity, like our sacrament prayer. He's talking about prioritizing that which is most meaningful to God. It's a vain repetition if we're not referring to the things that God wants us to be praying for. Repentance, to seek his spirit, to know how to serve others, to seek for the gifts that he has promised to send to us. When we are praying for others, it is rarely a vain repetition. But if it is insincere, it is vain. And let's remember to whom we are praying and to whom carries our prayers. And if we are remembering our Savior's sacrifice and our Father's gifts, it can't be insincere. It will be heartfelt. It will not be vain. I feel so strongly that our prayers need to be so much more than for physical safety. Help us to return home safely. Our prayers are that we can be kept within the Spirit. And the Lord says, your Father already knows what you need. I think we are missing the purpose of prayer if we think prayer is to just send off petitions to God. The purpose of prayer, we're told in the Bible dictionary, is for the child to align his will with the Father. And then in verse 9, he turns to plural. He says, I want you to pray ye. And so now for public prayers. And we know that in the early Christian church, they had prayer circles. And these prayer circles were with groups of disciples who could send off petitions before the Lord. We know that they prayed in their worship services when they um, reenacted the Lord's Last Supper. And I believe that this is the type of prayers that he's referring to in these group prayers. As we look at this prayer, it's often referred to, verses 9 through 10, as the Lord's Prayer. And beautiful music has been written to this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's interesting to look at the Lord's Prayer in its entirety and notice that one third of the Lord's Prayer is dedicated to praise. The Lord wants us to acknowledge and understand our God's greatness and our nothingness, that we should meekly fall on our knees before God, that we should humble ourselves and praise his name. The more we praise his name, the more our faith can grow, which then allows us to trust him, which then allows us to pray for what he wants and not what we want. Continuing on in the Lord's Prayer, verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. It's interesting to look at the daily bread in light of the promises made at the sacrament. 
Other translations read, give us this day sufficient for our needs. It's not just talking about our nourishment. It's talking about the needs for the spirit. It's talking about our needs to be able to sustain our emotional energy. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, the Joseph Smith translation adds an interesting touch. And for give us of our trespasses is changed to debts. We are in debt to our God. He is our redeemer. Debts is far more than just a monetary thing. This is talking about our sins here. And then it continues on. As we forgive those who trespass against us. The Joseph Smith translation continues to make changes in verse 13. Suffer us not to be led into temptation. Remember the King James says, and lead us not into temptation. This is a significant doctrinal change. You know, the Puritans thought that we were passive and could not act without the Spirit. And that God would lead us to temptations. They misunderstood even Jesus' temptations, that he went out seeking to be tempted. And Joseph Smith, he's making this change very, very early. This is before the church is even a year old. He's making these changes in the early winter of 1831. And he already knows that doctrinally, the Lord does not want us to be tempted. And so we are to plead with him, protect us from the tempter. Suffer us not to be leapt into temptation. And it's a very significant change, not only in Christianity at that time, but in, in, a, in totally understanding our relationship to God and our relationship to the adversary. We're asking him to keep us from evil. It includes a prayer to keep us from, from pornography and from anxiety and from all the sins of our generation, from, from, mis, from misunderstanding because we see through the lens of our culture rather than seeing through God's lens, through his word's lens. We need to be delivered from the devil's mentality. He continues on, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Remember that um, the praise to the Lord at the beginning and the end sets such a beautiful mode. Another verse 14 and 15 talk about forgiving men as Heavenly Father will also forgive us. This is a fabulous message, and it's repeated again at the end of the prayer For the second time, to make sure that this is well understood, the Lord often repeats things when he wants to make sure we got the message. If we want to be forgiven, we have got to forgive. Prayer is a wonderful time to ask the Lord, help us not to feel like a victim. Help us not to harbor ill feelings for others. Help us not to maintain anger and and frustration at those who have harmed us and wronged us. We can forgive and walk away. We can still be careful and cautious and not allow ourselves to be hurt again in a way that is inappropriate or abused, but we still need to say, thy will be done. You may be the judge. Protect me from feeling anger. And I believe with all my heart that by asking the Lord to take that feeling away, he will, he can, when our desires are pure. We continue on in chapter 6, verse 16 to 18, talking about proper fasting. He says, appear not to men only. I want you to appear to your Father in heaven to fast. Again, he's reciting this idea about making sure that our inner motives and our outer motives are correct. It reminded me of the fasting that is referred to in Isaiah. Do you remember back in chapter 58 of Isaiah in verses 5 through 7? He says, is not this the fast I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness and to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free. Ye break every yoke. Is not this to deal thy bread to the hungry? And he goes on and says, use your fasting as a time to serve others. Use your fasting as a time to come unto the Lord. Use your fasting as a time for repentance. So Isaiah is interesting because I see the Lord is using the same message that he, I, he gave Isaiah to share. And he's now using it for his apostles saying, you've, you've strayed away. I taught the prophets the right way. And now I'd like to remind you again what the prophet said. Verses 16 to 18 go on and talk now about anointing thy head and washing thy face. Now, usually we think of this in the context of don't appear to men to fast. But take it, step back and look at the whole Sermon on the Mount as a temple context. And he's talking also about when we go before the Lord, we need to be 
anoint our heads and wash our face. Do you remember back in Exodus, back in when Moses is talking about how to prepare Aaron and his sons for the priesthood, he says to wash and anoint them. Chapter Exodus 29, verse 7, and Exodus 30, 18 to 19, and also in verse 30 as well. This idea of the priest being washed and anointed prepared them to enter into the presence of God. It prepared them to receive uh, their um, opportunity to go and serve in the temple. And I believe that this idea of fasting is also one of worship, of coming before our God. He then continues on in chapter 6, verses 19 to 24, to talk about the requirement to give to those in need the requirement for the law of consecration. And if you want to look at the parallel verses, it's in 3 Nephi chapter 13, verses 18 to 24. I had a wonderful class from Hugh Nibley decades and decades ago where he taught us that the adversary's first article of false faith was that you can buy anything in this world with money. And later on, we've been taught by others that the root of all evil is the love of money. And this is what the Lord now refers to in chapter 6, verse 24. Thine eye may be single to the glory of God. We do not want to have our hearts set on power and riches and prestige and clothing and shopping and and IT and, and all sorts of techie stuff. Our eye is to be singled to God, whether we're at work or at school or at play, anywhere. We are to keep an eye single to God. And as we do that, we then will always remember him. We will be able to remember our promises of the sacrament, that if our eye is single, we can serve God more wholeheartedly. Chapter 6, verse 24 continues on, encouraging his apostles to only serve God. He says, you can't serve two masters. And remember, this time, one-third of the Roman Empire are in slaves, and half of the population in cities are living in some form of a servitude. It was probably more like an indentured servant. Um, the word servant and slave can is this consistent. It's the same word. But this idea of mammon is an idea of riches. You cannot serve God and mammon. He's talking about riches. We either need to trust and obey God or or if we are doubting and we're filled with despair, we will disobey God. That is also serving two masters. That is the adversary. And as I think about the adversary in my life, if I usually have a selfish thought, it is often from the adversary. But if I have trust, the first thing that comes to my mind, the first thoughts are often from the Spirit. And that is the voice of the Lord that is trying to teach me to serve Him. When you're serving two masters, it feels like you're being pulled apart. You know, your heart is wrenched. But the Lord says in the Joseph Smith translation that he wants you to go into the world, but don't care for the world, for the world will hate you. Nevertheless, then I'm going to skip down a little bit. Go forth from house to house teaching. Now, this is information for the apostles. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is just given to a very small select group in the book of Matthew, whenever the word disciple is used, it is referring to the 12, just as it does in 3 Nephi. Now, the Sermon on the Plain in Luke is different. That's to a broader audience. And this is not there. This is to those who are going to be in the full-time service of the Lord. And he says, I don't want you to worry about things of the world. I am going to take care of you. And he promises to take care of his disciples in verses 25 to 28. I'll give you a couple different translations. The KJV says, take no thought for your life. But the NIV says, don't worry about it. And the English Standard Version says, don't be anxious about your life. And then he continues on, is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? I love the next few verses in 26 through 28 on the lilies of the field. And just as a reminder, a lily in the KJV is actually a translation for a beautiful little red poppy. It's a type of flower that is very broad in its spectrum. And lily is translated by the English translators, but it's actually a beautiful form of the flowers that grow wild in Galilee as well as in Jerusalem. Many of them are these lovely red poppies. He says in verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air, 
Are ye not much better than they? Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. And then he makes this wonderful comparison between Solomon. He says, Solomon, all of his great glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, the beauty of our Savior's clothing is far different. And he's not talking about a physical level here alone. He's talking about a spiritual level. He wants to clothe us. He wants to endow us in his power. Remember the word endow or do is clothe. Verse 25 adds a huge Jojo Smith translation. He says, and your heavenly father will provide for you whatsoever things you need for food you shall eat and for raiment which he shall wear and put on. Take no thought for these things, but keep my commandments. This is a Joseph Smith translation edition. You know, he's asking us to add on obedience, and he will be able to close us as we obey him. He continues in verse 30 in the King James Version. If God so clothed the grass, then he continues talking about that. He said, shall he not much more clothe you? As he talks about this clothing, it's sometimes translated as putting on. It's, it's this idea of an endowment. It's the same roots. And there's two different words in Greek for it. The first one, indu, is raiment, putting something on, to dress or to clothe someone, to clothe oneself. The second one is more figurative. It's talking about taking on characteristics or virtues or intentions to put on something or to invest or to clothe something. This is very significant in the context of a temple text. Remember the priests in the ancient temples put on their beautiful white linens, their robes, their head coverings. This is very significant in light of the context that Christ is trying to call his disciples to a higher priesthood. He wants them to become apostles in very word and deed as priests. Joseph Smith also referred to this verse in a wonderful uh, sermon where he said, Joseph prayed that all the elders might receive an endowment in thy house. Thus, in the section of the Sermon on the Temple, Jesus can be understood as promising more than garments that offer physical protection for the body, although the, the garments do this too. He speaks of garments that endow the disciple with powers and virtues more glorious than Solomon's, unquote. And this is from um, Jack Welch's book, Illuminating the Sermon of the Temple, on page 68. He continues on in verses 32 to 34 to talk about building the kingdom of God on earth. Why is it the at that ye murmur among yourselves, saying, We cannot obey thy word? Seek not the things of this world but seek first to build up the kingdom of God. Over and over, the Lord is trying to readjust, turn our social paradigm on its head and say, stop caring for things about the world. We have thoughts coming from the world. We have style of fashion and patterns and dietary needs from the world. Don't do it. Do it for love of me. Obey my commandments. Follow my guidance. It's just a wonderful message. And then for the fifth and sixth time, he says in verse 34, take no thought or take no worry or don't be anxious. This is repeated again. There's a lot of continuity in this chapter on this. And as we're talking about not being anxious, remember the other Greek translation for this could be, uh, don't be troubled with cares or to look out for something, to promise one's interests. You know, just trust in the Lord. He's going to take care. Chapter 7 now begins with another large Joseph Smith translation. Jesus taught his disciples that they should say unto the people, Judge not unrighteously, but judge righteously. Now this is very interesting because usually we think judgment is inappropriate at any time. But going back to the Garden of Eden, do you remember that we were told there, and again repeated in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 46, that we need to learn from our own experiences how to judge between good from evil. One of the reasons why we're here is to learn how to follow the spirit, how to identify the spirit and how to identify the adversarial context or else even the natural man, our, uh, how to subdue our hormones and our passions. This gift of the discernment is something that our Savior restored again 
I mentioned section 46, verse 8 and verse 23, and Joseph Smith's cousin said, this is the topic that Joseph spoke more on than any other topic. The gift of discerning of spirits was something he wanted desperately. We also read about it in the Book of Mormon in Moroni, chapter 7, verse 16. The Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore, I will show unto you the way to judge. So in King James, we're not ever told how to judge. But as we look at restored scripture, in both the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Joseph Smith translation, we are taught we have to make judgments all the time. But we want to make judgments that are righteous judgments, and we are made them through the Spirit of the Lord, through the gifts of discernment by our Savior and through the gifts of the light of Christ that's given to all men who are born into the world. In the Sermon on the Plain, he has a small little section that looks a little bit like this, and he says in Luke chapter 6, verse 39, can the blind lead the blind? And that's when we go into this fun section about the moat and the beam. Remember, a moat is like a speck. It's this little speck of sawdust or something, and the beam is this large telephone pole-sized log. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 to 5, it reads, Don't try to take the moat or this little speck or sawdust that's in your brother's eye, but consider us not the beam that is in thine own eye. You know, we are blinded by our own sins. We are blinded by our own problems, and we are not seeing other people correctly until we can take out those enormous sins that are in our life as well. Then the Lord asks for a level of secrecy for sacred information. The Joseph Smith translation adds to Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Go ye into all the world, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come nigh unto you, and the mysteries of the kingdom keep within yourselves. So when you go out preaching, tell everyone that Jesus is the promised Messiah and call for repentance. But the things that are more sacred that I have been teaching you privately up here, keep those to yourself. And that's when he gives this phrase, do not give dogs what is sacred, nor throw your pearls to the pigs. That's the NIV translation. Of course, the KJV says pearls before swine. It's interesting that he talks about the same thing in the Old Testament. In Exodus 22, verse 31, and Deuteronomy 14, verse 3 through 21, we are told that pigs and dogs are unclean animals. And as unclean animals, they are not to be part of the Jewish or the Israelite diet. Don't add these things to your life. And so by saying, don't throw your pearls before swine and don't give dogs what's sacred, he's talking about don't give things to the unclean when they're not ready for them. Let's wait until someone is purified and sanctified and holy, and then they can be introduced to the higher law. It's interesting that's what we do in our temples. You have to wait a period of time from your baptism prior to be able to entering in to receiving your washings and anointings and endowment. Those that don't appreciate them will trodden them under feet. And sadly, we live in a day and age where that is seen. But he moves on in verse 7 to 11 in Matthew chapter 7 to give a threefold petition. We're told that he says to ask, to seek, and to knock. Now, this threefold petition is very interesting because he says, everyone who asks and the one who seeks will find. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. This is, again, the NIV translation. This beautiful promise from our God, that asking questions with a sincere heart is good. Seek for answers. Knock hard. Don't fall short. Don't rely on other people's thoughts. Get on your knees. Ask the Lord. You do the homework. You invest in the answer. And the Lord will answer you with great assurance through his spirit and through good literature and good places to look. I am convinced of this. Every question that I have had, which are many, 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 I have found answers to when I have meekly and sincerely sought them. Sometimes it's been years before I found answers, but they come when we ask in sincerity. The Lord then gives this interesting little parable. He says, if your son's going to ask you bread, will you give him a stone? In the Joseph Smith translation, they add something here in chapter 7, verse 9. They will say, we have the law for our salvation, and that is sufficient for us. The Lord is reminding them that some of the traditions that they have developed have changed the law of Moses. Before, it was 
the atoning sacrifice that was a type of the promised Messiah that was to lead them to being saved by their God. But over the thousands of years since that period of time, with all the addition and misunderstandings of other laws and traditions, they now think that it is the law, obedience to the law, that can save them. And that's why they've added these hundreds and hundreds and thousands of oral laws onto the Torah. And we get things all mixed up. It's not the law that can save us. Obedience is important, as we learn in the gospel of, or in the book of James, but it is not what saves us. It is the bread of life that saves us. When our son asks for bread, let us remember this in an allegorical way as well. The early Christians often looked at all these things symbolically. It's interesting to look at their early writings and their commentaries on the New Testament. They're saying if your son is asking for bread, give him the bread of life. Don't give him a stone. And if he's asking for a fish, don't give him a serpent. Now, this is allegorically, I think, referring to the teachings of our Savior versus the teachings of, our, of the adversary. Because remember, the Gospels are recorded in the time of the apostolic church. And at that time, Christianity was sometimes symbolized by a fish because the Greek word for fish use those same letters that refer to our Savior. So I've written it out here on my slide for you to see it. Jesus, or Jesus. Christos, or Christ. Theo, or God. Uno, or Son. And Sutor, or Savior. When you take the first letter of each of those, I-C-H-T-H-U-S, and then you write them in the Greek letters, it is the word fish. And so this was our early Christian symbol, and we even have it carved in walls and caves where early Christians were. So when your son asks for a fish, when they're asking for more light and knowledge, are you going to give him the adversary? No! Keep giving him what he asks for. Give him the teachings of our Savior Jesus Christ, not the adver adversarial teachings of the world. Chapter 7, verse 12 talks again about the Old Testament. He says, do to others what you would have them do to you. But he says in verse 13 to 14, in the higher law, the Joseph Smith translation adds, repent therefore and enter ye in at the straight gate. The way to enter into the gate is through repentance. I love the way that it's explained with straight as the straits of Gibraltar. Remember, straight is just entering into this narrow opening. The Lord wants us to enter into a narrow and difficult channel. And the way that we do that is through the forgiveness of our sins, which is through our Savior. Our Savior symbolically symbolized in the ancient temple, the veil. It is he who separates, allows us presence to enter back into the Father. He is symbolically that veil that is the place where he's the mediator, the one who is our advocate, who will speak for us before the Father. And in order to enter into his presence, as the high priest did on the Day of Atonement, we must repent. And then we can go through that narrow opening, that difficult channel. This is repeated in all three sections. Matthew 7, verse 13, Luke chapter 13, 24, and interestingly, in 2 Nephi, chapter 31, verse 17, we are told that entering into the straight gate that is mentioned in Matthew also includes this wide gate, this broad way that is the gate that leads to, to the Satan's realm. And then in Luke chapter 13, it says, strive to enter in the straight, S-T- R-A-I-T, the narrow opening, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and will not be able to. But it's not until we get into 2 Nephi, chapter 31 and 32, that we're told that the way that we enter is through baptism and remission of our sins. Our sins are forgiven through the fire and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He continues on down in chapter 32, verse 5. The Holy Ghost will show unto you all things that you should do. This is the blessing of 2 Nephi. This is the blessing of restored scriptures. It is such a gift. The Bible says it's going to be hard to make it. It's going to be hard to make it. It's going to be straight and difficult and narrow. And then the Book of Mormon says you do it through repentance, 
baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Marvelous message. Chapter 7, verse 15 to 20 in Matthew is consistent with the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6, verse 43 to 46. And now he talks about bearing fruit. He talks about this fruit of the tree of life. And he says, you can tell if something's good by looking at their fruits. Beware of false prophets. And you're going to know them by their fruits. And in our day and age, when there are so many voices, just like with Moses before Pharaoh, look at their fruits. Whose voice rang true? Do you have false prophets in your life? Are you listening to certain things that are wrong? And as we look at the false prophets in our lives, let's make sure that we hold tightly to the word of God and to the words of our Savior, because we want to be able to partake of the fruit of the tree of life. The idea of a fruit that is going to bear the tree of life is repeated often in Scripture. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The Gospel of John talks about this. Do you remember the Last Supper? Christ says, I am the vine and ye are the branches. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 refers to, again, the fruit of the tree of life. Jacob chapter 5, with the allegory of the olive tree, refers about the importance of bearing good fruit as a sign of following our Savior. Also in the book of Alma, chapter 31, verse 41 to 42, we read about this tree of life as actually our Savior. Our Savior is this fruit. He is the one who is hung on a tree, and it is through his gift of the atoning sacrifice that we can partake of the tree of life without our sins. And then we can enter into the presence of the Lord. That is where we go next in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 24. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Joseph Smith translation adds there, For the day soon cometh that men shall come before me to judgment, to be judged according to their works. And then it continues on in verse 22. Many will say to me that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done these mighty works? And he says, In the Joseph Smith translation, I profess unto them, you never knew me. Depart from me. Now, in the King James, it says, I never knew you. This is a very significant doctrinal change. God knows all of us. Of course he knows us. It is we who do not know him. If we're carrying out works without a pure heart, we are not knowing him. We are not receiving his gifts of faith and hope and charity. Chapter 7 then ends with this parable of the two houses. Everyone from very, very early age starts singing the song, the wise men built his house on the rock. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 29, and Luke chapter 6, verse 47 to 49. I mentioned that the Lord has a lot of parables, but most of them do not begin until after this initial few chapters. This is the first parable I found in Matthew, though. There are 22 parables in Matthew. Just as an overview on the parables in the gospel, we'll be coming up to the parables in the next few chapters. But there's 22 different parables in Matthew. The total are um, about 30 to 60, depending on how you count them. Different scholars come up with different numbers. But we'll point that out more when we get there in the next few chapters. However, in this parable on the wise man building his house upon a rock, this wonderful image of a rock is synonymous with the image of a redeemer. In the Bible, we refer to our Savior as our rock over 30 times. And so this image should have been very well known to these early Christians when Christ says, I want you to build your house on a rock. Symbolically, he is referring to the rock of our Redeemer. And it is also powerful to realize this is our Savior referring to, again, as a stonemason, not probably a carpenter. So Matthew chapter 7 asks, what is our foundation built on? Are we built on the sand? When the waves and the turbulent times come, are we washed away? And in addition to this being as literal, is it figurative? Is this also referring to an eschatological time at the last days when there will be great havoc caused by natural disasters if we are not based on our Lord? The Sermon on the Mount then ends and gives a new view of calling on God and coming unto Christ. This old concept of God as primarily an emergency source evaporates, as does the idea that we might still live our own lives with just God helping us a little bit now and then. 
This is the antithesis of what he's trying to teach us here. And then in chapters 7, verse 28 to 29, Matthew ends this beautiful sermon with, When Jesus ended these sayings, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is Matthew's mini Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus number is the Pentateuch of the Old Testament. And the Sermon on the Mount is the first time that the Lord then reviews the Pentateuch, uh, the Old Testament at its large. And he says the same phrase again in chapter 7, chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 19, and chapter 26. And that is where we see an organization to Matthew showing his gospel to follow the pattern of the Old Testament. And may we see Christ not only in the Old Testament, not only in the New Testament, but in our daily lives. May we look for miracles and may we apply the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.